And now I'd like to introduce you to Anne Campbell with Global Litigation Consultants. Um, Anne, thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna just make sure you're unmuted. And once I have that, please let us know all of the great work that you guys are doing at Global Litigation Consultants. Like the okay, there you are. There <laughs> you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me, Ginger. So we are an alternative legal service provider. So we what we can do is really help an attorney through the entire length of their case and really help streamline their process with services that we offer, such as medical record retrieval, medical record organization, case merit evaluation, as well as special needs trust and life care planning. And if they come up with a problem that they're uncertain on how to solve, they can reach out to me and we can come up with a custom solution for them. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Ann. And I know you guys work with clients all over the country. So I highly encourage everybody to reach out to you, especially if they have any questions. Yes, please do. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Kyle Kuhnberger with HMR. Um, great, great dear friends of ours, and we're so happy that they are here with us today. Kyle, thank you. If you don't mind, let us know every, let everybody know what you guys do and um, about all the great services that you provide. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, you know, I think most people know that we uh, we tend to get involved in cases where people are uninsured and or underinsured and they can't get the medical treatment they need. So we end up funding a lot of catastrophic cases like brain injuries and spine surgeries and amputees and burns. Um, but I think one of the things that, that actually probably helps the most is, is what we do behind the scenes. So, you know, our office, when we're working together with a lot of the law firms around the country, because we do this nationally, um, we're gathering all of the medical records and certified bills and, you know, basically doing all the legwork that maybe an office uh, paralegal might have to do and, and getting these cases not only worked up, but, you know, getting them ready to where an attorney can submit a demand package or have, uh, you know, everything they need for a mediation or prep for trial. So um, a lot of that legwork behind the scenes is, is uh, a lot of the good stuff that we provide and saves a lot of time. And obviously time becomes one of those precious things that attorneys need the most. So um, like I said, we do it around the country and all the funding we do is non-recourse. So um, you know, we truly are, are blessed to partner with a lot of law firms. So if we can help out on anything, uh, let us know. And we look forward to the, the coffee giveaway that we're going to do, uh, later this afternoon, we'll give away four bags of Peruvian roasted coffee. I cannot wait to see who the winner is going to be. And back to that point where how you work with law firms around the country. I mean, I know our John Romano loves working with you, the Romano Law Group. Yeah. Um, so again, thank you for everything you do and everybody, please, if you have questions, reach out to Kyle and, yeah. um, we'll see you back here in a little bit. Okay, Kyle. Bye, Haley. All right. And then I would like to go ahead and get this meeting started with our incredible moderator, Haley, who happens to work at the Romano law group. And, um, she handles a variety of wrongful death and personal injury matters, concentrating her practice on traumatic brain injury cases, as well as structural collapse cases. She actually did an incredible webinar that we did several months ago on collapsed cases. And Haley, I believe we're gonna to try to do a live seminar next December, um, if all works out, where you will be helping us um, put that together in Boston. Um, Haley also earned her Juris Doctorate from the Florida Coastal School of Law in Jacksonville, Florida, and her, business, her Bachelor of Business Administration from Stetson University. In addition to practicing law, Haley has a passion for supporting women in the legal profession. She's the founder and the co-chair of the National Trial Lawyers Women's Leadership Forum. And she's also a committee chair for the Palm Beach County chapter of the Florida Association for Women Lawyers, um, as well as being on the board of the Florida Justice Association's Women's Caucus. And she's also a member of the Palm Beach County Justice Association's Women's Caucus as well. They do a lot of great work over there. Um, Haley, we're so proud of you. And um, I also want to mention that you are not only on the board of the National Trial Lawyers Top 40, Under 40, but um, you're doing a variety of other things to help the community. So thank you for being with us today and moderating. And we look forward to it. And I think Coconut, he's ready to start the program. So 
You heard a little bark. That was him. <laughs> Enjoy it today. Thank you so much, Ginger, and thank you for that very kind introduction. And welcome everybody to today's webinar. We have a very exciting program um, for you today where we're going to be discussing tech tips for trial lawyers from investigation to preparation. And we have two wonderful speakers for you today. Before I introduce those two gentlemen to you, I do want to encourage everyone to use your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to input any questions that you may have for today's speakers. Once they finish their presentations, I'll join um, back to the webinar and help facilitate those to get your questions answered. So please do submit questions um, throughout the webinar and we'll get those taken care of for you at the end of the presentation. Um, we have two incredible speakers uh, for with us today. Um, first, we have Justin Kahn. He is a civil litigator with the Kahn Law Firm in Charleston, South Carolina. He handles professional liability, tort, product liability, contract, and other matters. Justin is AV rated and is board certified in medical malpractice by the American Board of Professional Liability Attorneys, where he also serves on the board. He is also board certified by the National Board of Trial Advocacy as a civil trial advocate and in practice pretrial practice advocacy. He is also a diplomat with the National College of Advocacy and American Association of Justice, and he is certified by the South Carolina Supreme Court as a civil circuit court mediator. Justin has lots of important tips for us trial lawyers on today's webinar. Also with us, we have Scott Geyer. He is the founder and CEO of Krubera LLC, an investigative firm that specializes in data-driven litigation support and due diligence located in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Prior to starting Krubera, Scott spent 15 years as an investigator with Smith & Carson Inc., where he helped various AMLAW 100 firms prepare for trials in mass, mass tort litigation. His cases included hundreds of Engel progen progeny tobacco claims and pharmaceutical actions. After earning his master's degree, um, he began exploring ways to merge computer program programming with traditional investigative methods and thereby creating a more efficient and insightful trial support platform. Scott is going to be discussing some important tips and tricks um, today, so I'm going to pass it over to Scott, Scott to get us started. Thank you, Hallie, for the wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm actually going to start by calling an audible on this presentation. Um, so everybody's heard of Murphy's Law, right? Um, and it just occurred to me that Murphy might have been an IT specialist because um, anything that can go wrong in tech will go wrong. Um, I had an entire presentation uh, planned for y'all today uh, using the Prezi interface with all of my slides appearing like a newscast on the screen next to my face. And the app crashed 15 minutes before the presentation started. So luckily, uh, and this is a lesson to be learned for all of us in tech, always have a plan B. And I do have some Google Slides with the same content that I'll be using to help illustrate some of the points. But um, you know, for the time being, just imagine that uh, you know, there's some really snazzy animated slides moving past my head. Uh, maybe my cat will jump on my shoulder and that will suffice. Um, so anyhow, uh, one thing that uh, Hallie did mention in my bio that I think I should mention because it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about, um, as I'm an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina, I teach interactive media in the journalism department. And many people raise an eyebrow when they hear that and wonder what the hell is interactive media. And uh, basically that's my department's fancy way of saying coding. Uh, I teach computer programming to students who aren't computer science majors. So it's basically coding for the rest of us. And I've been doing this for four years and uh, without fail, every semester before I can actually start teaching coding, I have to spend a lecture or two and discuss basic computer literacy and computer hygiene. And the first semester that this occurred, I was shocked because I figured, you know, I was teaching kids, you know, 19, 20 years old, and they grew up with this stuff. They're digital natives, right? Um, and I figured that they knew computers like the back of their hands and that all I had to do was come in and supplement their knowledge with some programming languages that they weren't familiar with. No, 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 no. Uh, 
they don't know, many of them don't know the first thing about how to operate and maintain a computer. And this seems somewhat ironic, but I think over the years, what I've realized is that we've all gotten so accustomed to this instant gratification, uh, plug and play, there's an app for that culture where if the tech doesn't work by simply pushing a big green button and having it do everything for us, uh, it, you know, get to the tax refund and make some macaroni and cheese. If it doesn't do all of that and more, then we figure it must be broken. Let's move on to the next piece of tech. Um, but the problem, and what I tell my students is, the problem is this, your computer that you are all on right now is not an app. It is a machine, just like a rake or um, a combine harvester or a loom. It is a machine with parts that work in order to uh, enable all these other uh, things to happen, all of these, these pieces of software. And just like a farmer who operates a combine harvester, you can't just turn the engine on and hold the steering wheel and hope for the best. You need to know a lot about how to operate it. You need to know basic things like maintenance, basic repairs, and that is going to make your life easier. It's gonna make it more efficient. It's gonna make you a better farmer. And in our world, all of us that are listening to this right now, the computer is our combine harvester, all right? So what I'm gonna talk with you today about is some things that I have to go with over with my students. I'm gonna give you a truncated version of this sort of computer hygiene and ticks, uh, tricks and, and tips you can use to make your life easier, uh, kind of a boot camp. all right? Uh, now, if this seems a little bit rudimentary or dare I say pedantic to some of you who are pretty skilled with this kind of stuff, great, I'm glad to hear that. But I, experience tells me that most people tend to realize that they're doing a lot of things wrong and they get a lot from this. So I hope that's the case for you. All right, that's enough prologue. So let's get on here. Like I said, I've got some backups, some Google slides. So I'm gonna share my screen and pull that up and hope for the best. Uh, and here we go. And let me pull up my Google slides. Now you see that the screen was asleep. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. All right. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so we're going to start today with the most basic of basic things, which is just keeping your machine in good working order. Things that everybody should know, they should ha have to learn this in order to even buy a $1,500 device, right? Um, now, when I'm talking about computer hygiene, I want you to know I'm not talking about aesthetics, okay? I'm not a neat freak, all right? My, if you went upstairs, you'd be aghast to see the condition of my bedroom with the, uh, I've got a chair that's designated for dirty laundry, essentially, and it looks like Kilimanjaro. Um, it's not about aesthetics, it's about efficiency. When your computer is sloppy, you can't get stuff done efficiently. And so this is really what it's about, all right? So let's just start with the basics. Number one, please turn off your damn computer every day. I do not know who started this rumor or when, but it's been pre prevalent for years now. Some people, will leave, they'll be at work, especially if it's a desktop that sits on their desk and they'll leave the computer on at the end of the day and just close it or whatever and go home. And they'll come back and say, yep, here we go, everything's fine. It's not, okay? Leaving your computer on overnight is not a good idea unless you are downloading an OS, a new operating system that takes hours or I don't know, you're rendering 3D video for the next Disney Pixar film or something. But in ordinary circumstances, turn it off. Not only is it going to save energy and it's gonna preserve the life of your computer, the most important thing is it clears out the, the temporary memory, the, the persistent storage. Everything you do on your computer during the day is stored in ones and zeros on your computer so that it has ready access to it the next time you need it later that day. And if you don't close your computer down and reboot it, then all of that persistent storage builds up and it builds up and eventually it's like you poured molasses on your hard drive. All right, so that's the simplest thing, but also the most effective. You know, the old joke in IT when somebody calls with frantic, you know, computer problems is, well, have you tried turning it on and off again? You know, or, or just restarting? And it's funny because it's true. It's true, it works because it clears out all of that, that memory from your day's work, right? So that's the first thing, turn your computer off. While we're talking about power, do not charge your battery as a rule more than 80%. Now, the lithium ion batteries that are in most computers now, they've come a long way, but compared to the rest of the tech involved with computers, 
they're still, I mean, pretty much energizer batteries for all intents and purposes. And when you uh, leave it plugged in at 100%, it's cooking your battery and it's wearing the life down. Conversely, if you are the type who leaves it, it drains it down to the single digits, four or five percent or whatever, that's putting a lot of stress on the battery too. So the sweet spot as a rule is 20 to 80 percent. So when you see it get it above 80, just unplug it and get in the habit of doing that. And then this one here is another big one. I tell my students every day when you start work or when you finish work, delete your downloads folder. Um, so of course, everybody should know what this is. I'm going to show you this is here. Oop, hold on a minute. The irony of, uh, there we go. I was gonna show you that later about how to clean up your desktop. Um, when you're looking at the downloads folder, okay, you're gonna have, these are some things that I did earlier today, of course. You might say, well, wait a minute, I need some of this stuff. And chances are you do, but that's a good chance to do, that's a good opportunity to take inventory of what you're working on. If it's something you need, you may have copied it or moved it to another folder. And guess what? Now you have two copies of it. You never need two copies, right? The downloads folder is, is just a temporary repository, right? You show you basically can clean house and get rid of everything every day. And that frees up a ton of space and it frees up some memory on your computer. The big thing you want to do is anytime you see a file that's .dmg, so like I had to install these today, I had, had to get a new version of Firefox, this disk inventory, these DMG files are uh, incredibly large, as you can see, 76 megabytes, right? And all they are is shells that are used to deliver the packages, right? And you, you don't need those. You can get rid of everything. I'm just gonna get rid of all of this and delete it. Uh, while I'm doing that, by the way, let's take a look at a little quick shortcut that a lot of people don't realize. My students uh, often stop me and say, wait, how'd you do that? Um, as you know, probably you can go command A on a Mac to select everything or control A to select everything in a window on a window on a PC. Scott, we can don't also see your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. See, this no is why I needed that Pretzi. No Thank you, Justin. This <laughs> is why we needed that, uh, that Pretzi uh, thing to be working. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Okay, here we go. So, all right. So now everybody should be seeing my desktop. Okay, so when you need to just select everything, but it's not everything in the window, a good option is to just choose the first file that you need, hold down shift, and then the down arrow. And then you can select everything that you need to delete without selecting everything at once. Um, so uh, click shift, and then down arrow. And I'm just gonna go ahead and move all this stuff to the trash. Uh, that one probably too, but I'll hold off. Okay, so get rid of your downloads folder. That'll make a big difference right off the bat. Um, Okay, and okay. So cleaning up the downloads is only the first step. Um, there's also programs that are running in the background of your machine that you don't even realize. And they're, they're programmed to auto boot. And just God, to, I, to, I don't to, mean to interrupt, but I got a question. You, you yeah, said get rid of your downloads folder. Do mm -hmm. you mean literally get rid of your downloads folder or get rid of stuff in it? <laughs> oh, I meant, yeah, sorry. That's a, a split in hairs. Yeah, I meant the, the contents inside the downloads okay. folder. I just don't no, want no, you very start deleting their <laughs> downloads folder. Oh, no. Yeah, no, you very much need your downloads folder. Um, and in fact, I imagine if you tried to get rid of it, either it wouldn't let you or it would just make a new one when you downloaded. So um, no, get rid of the contents in it because it's not really doing you any good. Um, and with Mac, uh, the latest OS, when you download software, it automatically gives you the option of getting rid of the .dmg file and moving it to trash because they're aware that it's such a problem. So um, if you have that on your operating system, definitely take advantage of it. Okay, so, um, all right, so let's talk about cleaning up uh, the programs in the background that are causing trouble. This one uh, often happens with my students. Um, they'll have to restart their computer and I'm trying to help them with their code and it takes 10, 15 minutes to get their computer going. And they're like, oh, I just bought this machine, you know, a month ago. I don't understand what's going on. And it's often because of the stuff that's going on in the startup disk. So um, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. If you are on a Mac, okay, and you go into system preferences, okay, and then you click on users and groups, right, and then login items, you'll see a list of programs that are uh, that are meant to auto load, they're gonna boot up when you, when you turn on your machine, okay? I've already gotten rid of the ones that I know I don't need doing that in the background and it speeds up my machine, but you'll find a whole bunch of them. And to make changes, you can just click the lock, enter your password, 
And then you can just click hide on the ones that you don't want running automatically in the background. That saves a ton of RAM. And it'll, I've seen it uh, shave off a good 10, 15 minutes on the boot up time with some of my students' machines. On a PC for Windows, uh, the, uh, what is that? Yes. Okay, that is the start, yes, the, 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 the search menu. So as you know, if you're a Windows user, pretty much everything that you do um, is predicated on that search bar in the left corner. So you go to the search bar and you click, um, and you just type in startup, it'll take you to the startups page and then you type startup apps or you click on startup apps and it gives you a nice list of all those programs running in the background. And you can just uh, enable or disable the ones as you go. That is huge. Uh, it, I think if you're having problems with your computer running slow, especially at the beginning when you start the day, try that and see if that makes a big difference. And then also once you start working, uh, let me share my screen again here. Uh, once you start working, you'll see that on a Mac, especially everything that you have open has a dot, all right? And that means, I mean, everything that you, that you have open, whether or not it's being actively used, the fact that it's still open, it has a dot. And that's there to remind you that, hey, this is still open even though you're not using it, right? Like I had iTunes open earlier, even though I wasn't using it. Some programs, when you, uh, you have them open, but you're not using them, will absolutely eat your memory. So for example, like I often use Photoshop for work. And I'll use it in the morning and then I will go on to other things and I forget that I still have it open. And then I go in and I look and it's using over one gigabyte of memory uh, just sitting there in the background while I'm not using it. Well, when you're talking about some machines that only have four, eight gigabytes of memory total, then that's taking out a huge chunk of the processing power in your computer. So make sure you close anything that you're not actively using. Um, it's just a good habit to get into. I believe the latest Windows 10 also has some sort of a iconography with the dot, but I haven't used a PC in a while, so I apologize. Um, oh, and when I said that, you know, I, I went in and I looked to see like what kind of uh, memory the programs were eating up, here's how I did that. And I'll let you see this as well. So on a Mac, if you click on the uh, search uh, magnifying glass icon and just start typing activity monitor, a ACT will do it, okay? This is showing you everything that's happening in the moment on your computer, okay? So like at the activity monitor itself is taking up 64% of the, the processing space right there. Let me put it on memory here, okay? And okay, so you see this, like I have disk inventory running in the background right now because um, I'm about to show you what that does. Um, other, after that, I'll close it. But you see that's using almost four gigs of memory. On a lot of machines, that's enough to basically cripple. Uh, cripple your workflow. So uh, you can see that. And then while you're already in the activity monitor, all you have to do is just choose the thing that you want to get rid of and just click on the X and it'll, it'll kill that. It'll, it'll close it. Doesn't, doesn't erase it. It just stops the process to free up the memory. Um, now, another thing you'll see often when you're looking in the activity monitor. Oh, before I get to that, let me let you know for the Windows users. Windows has a similar thing and it is in the task manager. I cannot demonstrate that, of course, um, right now, but um, let's see here. But in, I believe on Windows, you go Control Alternate Delete and then Task Manager. And then when you go into Task Manager, if you click on More Details, it will um, open up a menu that lets you see what's going on. It's the same as the Max Activity Monitor. And you can, you can kill the programs as you, as you want. So, um, and I will, uh, I believe we're recording this and I will, I can share all of these shortcuts and things with you uh, gladly if you wanna um, have a crypt sheet for doing these sort of things. Um, now, when you're looking in the activity monitor, you'll see a lot of times there's some strange guests invited to the party. Like what the hell is cap host? Okay, icon services agent or something. Most of them are innocuous. Well, ideally when you're working, all of them are. Um, but um, sometimes you'll see something that's taking up a ton of memory and it's got a strange name. Whenever you see that, it's a good idea. Go ahead and Google it because a lot of times when you take a look at it, you'll find out that it's actually malware um, or it's something that you really don't need working in the background and you can just, uh, you can kill it, okay? Uh, this is a, one of the first things that IT guy is gonna do when you're having computer problems or you take it to the Apple Genius Bar or whatever. They're going to see, well, what software is running in the background that's causing trouble? OK. 
okay? So this is a big one. This will help you clean house, okay? And then every once in a while, when you uh, are, excuse me, every once in a while, uh, you need to take another step beyond just cleaning the startup menu and looking in the activity monitor. Uh, it's a good tip to actually go ahead and do an inventory of everything on your machine. So um, let me close this. Okay. Um, so uh, if you're on a Mac, you can download free software. It's called Disk Inventory X. If you're on Windows, it's called Winderstat, W-I-N-D-I-R-S-T-A-T. They do the same thing, uh, just different names. And then you run the program and then it does an inventory of your machine, okay? And you see what they call a tree map of everything on your computer and how much space it's taking up. And this is a lifesaver after you've had your computer for a few months or a few years, because invariably you'll see some things that are just cramping your style and you need to get rid of them. So for example, uh, a few months ago, I was working on uh, developing a mobile app uh, and I was using Xcode uh, and my machine was starting to act janky. And I said, what's going on? And it's this, you get all of this stuff here is Xcode and Xcode uh, related files. This is Xcode. This is uh, a lot of, this is Xcode and it's a behemoth. And hey, we, um, I don't think we can see your screen. No, here. am I still doing that? See, this is what happens when <laughs> you plan one way and you have to do a U-turn. Sorry about that. Hold on a minute. Okay, there you so go. Uh, here we go. All right, so here is the, the Disk Inventory X. So you can just go to Google Disk Inventory X for Mac or Windersat for PC and download it and then run it. And it's gonna build this tree map showing you the contents of your computer. And you can get an insight. So when you hover over the different items in the tree map, it shows you what it is and where it is, right? And you'll see in things in there where you go, I don't know what this is or if I need it. And chances are there's going to be some large squares in this tree map that you don't need. And it's going to speed up your computer drastically if you get rid of them. And you'll also see when you're hovering over these that many of them are in directories that you can't get to easily, right? They're sort of behind the scenes. And the one that you're going to need to use the most if you're trying to perform some maintenance on your computer is in your library. Um, so if you are on a Mac, um, let me close this here. So if you're on a Mac and you need to get into your library, you'll see it's not available in your menu here, okay? But it holds the lion's share of the contents of your machine. So how do you get to it? You go to the Go menu, okay, on a Mac, and then you can go to Folder, okay? And I've done this recently, so it's already there. And then what you do is you use this symbol called the tilde. I don't know why it's called the tilde, but that's the squiggly. And then you enter your username for your machine. So you, if you have multiple users on your, on your computer, then you would want to use your end of it. And then slash library. And what the tilde does is it says anything, like it skips tons and tons of steps in the path to that folder, right? Because uh, otherwise you'd have to enter a long, long, long path to get to the correct library folder. And then that'll take you there. And then now you'll see all sorts of stuff that you didn't know was there, not the least of which are caches and cookies. And these build up over time and become absolute monsters. You you some of them you might want to keep, but most of them you don't need. Um, so when your computer starts acting funny and giving you trouble, go into your library, clear out caches, clear out cookies, and then you can go from there. There's tons of stuff on the internet about this, um, especially for Mac. I mean, it's also for PC. Uh, and it'll help you uh, get rid of some things that are causing trouble, okay? All right, so, okay. So we've cleaned house, right? We got rid of the downloads folder. We got rid of stuff that was running in the background, okay? We did a software inventory, right? Um, now let's talk about, uh, we're still seeing the screen here, yeah. Let's talk about um, actually cleaning up what you have left. So you've whittled it down to the things that you have left, okay? And like I said, this is not about aesthetics. This is about efficiency. So if your machine looks like, let me see if I can find my slide, because like I said, I had to do this on the fly here. Um, if your machine looks like this, I am not passing judgment, okay? Uh, that's fine. If you can work that way and you're efficient, then great. 
but chances are you have a hard time finding things quickly when you need them, all right? So the easy way on a Mac is to clean these things up is to use stacks, all right? So if you go up to the top and you click view, use stacks, it will automatically organize things, I think using AI to get into a, a, a system of stacks that works well. I'm gonna turn this off and you'll see. So here are screenshots I was, I was pulling uh, for the presentation uh, the other day. And if I hadn't used stacks, this is what my desktop would look like. And then to manually clean this up, I would have had to grab them, put them into a folder, put that somewhere, and that's just extra work. But when you use stacks, it says, oh, those are all screenshots. I can just put them into a pile called screenshots. All right. And then an even more powerful uh, thing that you can take advantage of with stacks is grouping them. And the best way to group your stacks is by tags, all right? So if you go into a folder, and I apologize, if you have any questions now, let me know. I, 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 I might be going a little fast, but um, if you click on a folder, you can, anything, I'm just gonna click on my UNC folder here and you get the info and you look up and add, there's a, a window here for tags, okay? And they have some that are built in by default, colors and then home, work and all that sort of thing. And then you can create your own. So for example, when I was with Smith Carson, I had hundreds and hundreds of cases. Each was a plaintiff in a toxic tort. So, I mean, and you know, some were active, some were in an inactive. I had tobacco claims, Oxycontin, Roundup. And after a couple of years, the current um, way of organizing it didn't match the way I needed it to be organized in the moment. So like if I needed to see which ones were active and which ones were inactive, there was no way of doing that just by having a folder with all the plaintiff's files called tobacco. But if you use tags, you can. So like I can have a tag for like inactive case or med mal case or uh, whatever you're working on, add that tag to it. And then when you go to uh, stacks, let me close this. You group stacks by tags, it will organ, no matter how they were originally organized, it'll extract from the different folders and put them into a, a, a way that you can quickly find the things that you need. Um, stacks are big and a lot of people don't know about that. On PC, uh, I don't think they have uh, anything quite like that. Um, yeah, I know there's a way if you right click on your desktop screen, you can sort and there's different ways to sort it by category, but I don't know if they have anything similar to stacks. Um, so I apologize if this is uh, geared more towards the Mac folks, but um, most of the things that I'm gonna talk about here are relevant to both Mac and PC. All right, so, um, okay, cool. So uh, we're talking about cleaning up the computer. You've got your files here, you've got them organized. You can also color code them, which you see. And if you're curious about how to do that, uh, I don't have an hour to explain that. There is no easy way to manually color code your files on a Mac. Um, on a PC, I believe it's pretty easy. You can just right click on the folder and go to, uh, you can change the settings of properties and choose a color at least on Windows 10, I think. Um, but on Mac, you can do it, but it's a really Byzantine way of, of trying to do it. The easiest way if you're a Mac user and you wanna color code your files is to uh, use a program called Tinted Folders Lite. And uh, you just download the software. I see I have it on my machine. Tinted Folders Lite. And then you can just grab a folder in there and then choose a color uh, that you want. And there you go. Oh, and it didn't work. Um, and so you can color code folders. This seems like a small detail, but you know I, I teach UI and UX as part of my class, user interface and user experience. And they talk constantly about uh, reducing the cognitive load. You know That's the name of the game in web design. And anytime you can reduce the cognitive load, you're doing yourself a service. So if you have two folders that you need access to most often, it behooves you just go ahead and color code them so your eye doesn't even have to look for what it is. It's just boom, it leaps right off of the screen. Okay, so you got everything organized on your machine and now you're ready to work, all right? So working in 2020, soon to be 2021, as we all know, that means being on the internet. I mean, not constantly, I'm speaking to trial attorneys, but my half of this presentation, which I hope segues nicely into Justin's, is the research phase of things, discovery. Like that's what I specialize in as an investigator is helping attorneys with the discovery phase of their work. So when you're in discovery and you haven't gotten a trial yet, you're going to be online constantly, of course. So you need, in addition to cleaning up your own machine, you need to learn how to clean up your browser. 
and you need how to you learn how to use your browser efficiently. And so that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, and then we'll start off here just by talking about the most basic thing that many people don't know. Uh, again, my students, uh, uh, I have to tell them this every year. Uh, I've yet to meet a student that didn't know this. Um, but the difference between a refresh and a hard refresh, okay? So I'm going to go to, um, let's see, I'll do connectionology. Uh, apparently I'm typing in Turkish. Okay, and it took me to the registration. All right, so uh, let's say I was having trouble registering for this, right? The website's freezing, there's pop-ups, all sorts of problems. Hitting refresh up in the corner doesn't do anything, not really. Um, what it does is tantamount to just stirring the contents of a clogged up toilet bowl, right? All of the stuff that's clogging the toilet is still there. All you're doing is just sloshing the water around. When you actually need to clean house on the browser and kind of do a, a, a reset, you got to do a hard refresh, which is in, on a Mac is shift command R. And you see that that takes a little while longer. It's got the, and what that does is it clears out all the cache, all the cookies, all the code that's running in the background. Basically, let's be honest, to track you. And um, that's how you can fix a lot of problems when web websites aren't performing correctly. It's shift command R on a Mac. And then on a PC, you're going to do um, shift control R will be the shortcut for, um, for Windows users, okay? A more circuitous way of doing it on a uh, Mac is you can do command Y. And then this will take you to your Chrome. If you're in Chrome, it will take you to your browser history and you can go ahead and clean house this way. Uh, I'm not going to do that now because I don't want to get disconnected from some of the things we need. Um, so that's a big one that, that when you're, when you're working and things aren't going well, doing a hard refresh helps. If you're on Safari, it's command option E, uh, but in Chrome and Firefox, the shift command R will work, uh, most of the time. Okay. Now, another issue that often comes up, especially with my students that, um, causes problems when people are on the web is you have lots and lots of tabs open, right? So I only have a couple right now. But look, you may be one of those people that opens a window, doesn't close it, and just opens a new one when you want to go to a website. And then by the middle of the day, by lunchtime, you've got 100 tabs open in the, uh, on the top of your um, browser, OK? Look, if that works for you and it's efficient, fine. Uh, I would argue that it's not the best because once, you once the tabs are so small, you have to hover over each one in order to find out what it is. But if that's the way you work, that's fine. However, you need to keep this in mind. Every tab that is open in the background that you're not currently using. So like every, um, you know, this page, right? When I'm, I've, I visited it, but I, you know, I'm not looking at it anymore and I go back to my presentation. Even though I'm not actually on this uh, connectionology site anymore, it's still using up memory. In fact, every open tab in a browser takes up about 120 megabytes of your computer's RAM. So, I mean, you do the math, if you have 10, windows just 10 windows open uh on your machine you're talking 1.2 gigabytes of ram which is a ton and that's going to slow you down big time so if you're one of those people that likes to keep a lot of windows open a lot of tabs open in the, in the top that's fine but then i highly recommend you use a chrome extension um this is also i believe available in firefox and add-on and it's called the great suspender and what that does is it puts all of the inactive tabs to sleep so that it's not using your computer's processing power in the background. And then when you want access to it, you just click. All right. And so it puts everything else to sleep. So here's my wife's Facebook page, which we're gonna look at later. Uh, it puts it to sleep. And then when you wanna see it, you can click on it. Uh, this speeds up your machine immeasurably. Uh, I'm a big fan of this. Uh, and I don't even, I'm not the type to even keep a ton of tabs open. But um, it's a big, it's a big help. Now, uh, one thing you want to be cognizant of when you start using Chrome extensions, if you're not familiar with them, is that yes, they're awesome. Yes, they're super powerful, and they do tons of different things for you, and they're all free. So, what does that mean? You've probably heard this adage before, but if the tech is free, you are the product, right? So, 
if there's an awesome app that's doing something great for you and making your life easier and you're not paying for it, that's because they're getting your data. And, you know, everybody knows about Facebook, but pretty much every piece of free technology that's available via the web today is at least in a side operation, it's a, it's a data mining operation. Now it's a trade-off, right? When privacy and data security are really a topic that we could put aside for another webinar. In fact, that would be a really a good one to have. There's too much to talk about to, to discuss it all in detail here. I'll just say this, like when you wanna start using Chrome extensions, I'm gonna to go to the Chrome extension store. So the Chrome web store and Firefox also has some, they call theirs add-ons. You just need to, so let's look at Great Suspender. You just need to do your homework a little bit. And the rule of thumb is if it's got a lot of users, this one has more than 2 million users, it's got good reviews and there has been no report of any malware or spyware, then they're on the up and up 99 times out of hundred. Google also audits all of those, uh, all the Chrome extensions before they're allowed to be on the platform. Um, and you'll hear about trouble before it brews usually. Uh, only once in the years that I've been using Chrome extensions, have I gotten a warning, it said, we, and it automatically disabled the extension because there was a report of malware through it. So I didn't even have to actively do anything on my end. Um, but if you're working with sensitive data, you're working with clients data, or something that you want to keep super private, you know, it's a trade-off. You might want to think twice about using some uh, Chrome extensions and things like that. Um, VPN and other privacy measures will not affect Chrome extensions. Um, because Chrome extensions actually access the sites that you're looking at. So what you're seeing on your screen is what they're seeing, um, more or less. And uh, so even though you, you, if you might use a VPN to reroute your IP address, it might make you private, but it's not making your browser private. So uh, just keep that in mind. Okay. Oh, all right. I actually want to go back to my, okay. Okay, let's get to everyone's favorite topic here. All right, let me share my screen again. I apologize again for having to switch back and forth. I uh, am accustomed to the Prezi where this stuff is on the screen next to my face. Okay, so let's talk about how to Google. Uh, this is actually, I adopted this from a lecture that I've had to give to my students from time to time. Everyone rolls their eyes at first and they go, seriously, we're gonna like, how to Google? Um, yeah. We're gonna learn how to Google uh, because I found that many, many people don't really know how to do it right, especially when they're super busy and they need to get stuff done, okay? Let me, uh, let me test this theory, okay? So this was supposed to be finance because this is a rough draft, okay. Um, so here it is. Um, yeah, all right, this is, all right. So this is a finance. So you need to find out information about this guy. Okay, his name is Michael Jordan, all right? And he lives in Chicago and he works in finance, all right? That's, that's our guy. And for whatever reason, uh, you need to find out about Michael Jordan, Chicago, and he works in finance. Google it. Now, of course, you don't have to actually do this, but just in your mind's eye, what would you Google to find out about Michael Jordan in Chicago, and he works in finance, right? Okay, so I, I, I pitch this sort of thing to my students and they start going blah, 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 blah. And yes, they, sometimes they land ass backwards into it, you know, just by Googling lots of things, they'll get to it. But nobody ever thinks to do this. And if you did, please chat me. I wanna see uh, if you're that astute. Did anybody think to do this? Okay, and now I'm going to go. Don't Google the name and the details. Google the image. I gave you a picture of the guy. Use it. So I'm going to get the screenshot. All right, and then we go. Interesting, interesting. And you will see. Usually, you will see things that never go right when they're supposed to go right. You will see where it matches. 
let me see if I can try another one here. Um, and you will find the, where is that guy? No. Yes, let's try that. Hard refresh, don't know why that's coming up. Mm. So if you do an image search, it will look for any, whoop, it will look for any uh, place where that image appears. And it is not happening right now, which really defeats the purpose of, this, uh, of what I'm saying here. But if you, let me try it one more time here. I think I called it Jordan and Hector. Okay, so it worked this time. All right, so uh, hit or miss, but you, you do the image search and it, it uses AI to scour the web and find any place that this guy's picture appeared. And then here we go, it matched. And you can find, make sure, go in there and look. Yep, that's him, and there he is. He's Michael P. Jordan. He works for Silver Point Capital in Chicago, and that's him. So if you have a picture of somebody, especially if it's a headshot, the first thing you want to do is search the image instead of searching for the, uh, the words, okay? But look, a lot of the times you're not going to have the image to go on, of course. You're just going to have his name. He's, uh, he lives in Chicago and he works in finance. So this is where we get into smart uh, Googling. Am I still sharing here? Because it, yeah, okay, good. Um, so this is where we talk about smart Googling, all right? So first of all, we're talking about Michael Jordan. We're not looking for any website that includes the words Michael and includes the words Jordan. We're looking for Michael Jordan. So anytime you have a very specific name or a uh, phrase or something, put it in quotes. This will only match the name Michael Jordan if the Jordan appears after Michael and capitalized, okay? And since we know this guy's, let's say you have the, the name Michael B. Jordan, this will automatically weed out Michael Jordan, the Hall of Fame basketball player, and it'll only show Michael B. Jordan's, okay? And I think we already found the guy. Oh, not yet. Okay, so we start with that and the, the quotes. I use quotes probably more often than I don't use quotes when I'm uh, doing research on a case. So we do that. And then you say, okay, we have more information. I'm gonna get, let's say we don't know his, we don't know his middle initial. Well, what information do we have? This is where you're gonna to wanna to use Booleans, which are true false statements, right? You're gonna say, well, we know it, uh, he lives in Chicago. So, and Chicago. And of course that's not gonna help because Michael Jordan paid for Chicago, but we know he works in finance. Okay, and let's just see that. Okay, look, there's the guy again, by the way. But, uh, so we got lucky, but still most of the results are gonna be Michael Jordan, right? So how do you uh, separate the wheat from the chaff? That's where you can use the minus sign. So you can go minus, basketball, minus NBA, you know, you get the idea, minus player, minus bulls, just to be safe. And now there he is, he's the first person that comes up. Well, that's just like, I'm not gonna link it in the long run. So uh, he, that's his LinkedIn profile. Um, and you see that by using the minus sign, it got rid of all of the results that would have been about Michael Jordan, the basketball player. Um, and of course, this is germane to all sorts of searches, not just famous people with common names, but including Booleans and minus signs will make a huge difference when you're trying to find things. And that's just the start. There's all sorts of things you can do. How about this? Let's talk about searching within a site. All right. I'm going to pick on Justin a little bit here. Uh, he's, he's a good sport. So let's say we're looking um, for everything we could find about Justin, Justin Kahn. And we know he's an attorney, so I'm going to include that. All right. And what do we know? Well, I know Justin lives and works in Charleston. So the local paper is the Post and Courier. So I'm going to go site colon uh, post and courier .com. And now all I'm seeing is every instance in which Justin has been mentioned has appeared in the Post and Courier. And I can tell you as an investigator, this would be one of the first things that I would do. If I were investigating Justin Kahn, uh, and, and if you hired me to investigate him, and let's say he's the defendant um, in a, uh, a personal injury case, 
I do this. I know where he lives. I go to the, the likely newspaper. This is the first thing I do. Um, not often, but uh, this will <laughs> more often than not, it'll show you almost somebody's life story in terms of their media coverage and in terms of what they do and who they are. Um, another thing that you can do to uh, get a better picture of someone or do some quick research is if you have a key website that your subject is involved with, then you can use that as the basis of the Google search. So what you can do is you can say related, and then let's say, what is the website? I'll do con, well, I think it's con law firm. Law and firm, that's a landscaping company. Okay, and three things came up. So what this did in the Google search is it said, show me any site that it has been associated with con law firm. And you can tell right off the bat, like I already know looking at this, well, he's probably a personal injury attorney in Charleston. What it tells then, me is somebody's bought my name and they've got ads yeah. associated with it. <laughs> I was waiting for you up here in Texas or is that, I think that's in Texas. Um, oh no, they added the, there you go. They got around it. Yep, yep. Um, now here's one of the nice uh, ancillary benefits of doing the related colon search here is that this is a dynamite way to find witnesses. So if you have somebody that's closely associated with a, a website and you do related, you'll find, I, I, Justin, may I ask, do you know anybody at Boston Law Group, Bosick? No, no, no. That's, no, that's why I think it's funny. I think that what they've done is they must have, um, they must have either bought the domain or uh, done something with Google to buy that name or something. Cause those, those are two other, I'll call them competing law firms. So they must have done something with Khan. Oh. You know, so no, this is just so Google's search bots have an algorithm that finds related websites. So like if I do related uh, Amazon.com, okay, so it's going to give me Walmart overstock mm -hmm. Macy's. So these are see these are sites that are related. They're similar to Amazon, right? Um, so like in your case, it's saying Charleston personal injury law firms are most likely related in the same wheelhouse as con law firm. So mm -hmm. that's how those are coming up. Now they may well have done something surreptitiously to hijack your site. I I don't know, but um, the related colon search uh, is a really good way to quickly find some witnesses when somebody works. Is there so a you place have, to like, find an, a list of codes like that to use? Uh, well, if we share the slides uh, in today's webinar, um, I can give you all of those. Um, and I am more than happy to put together a list of, uh, of some of these shortcuts, um, the Booleans, colons. And I imagine if you just Google, um, Ironically, yeah, maybe share that. There's another question that I know you're going to answer. Yep. Somebody was just asking about um, Chet, who I think is in North Carolina, is asking about downloading full websites. Mm -hmm. So that might be a question. To yep. Yep. Answer. We're going to get to that. Yep. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to show you how to how to download an entire website content um, and do it and like a social media profile that's huge. How to do that quickly using a, a little snippet of code. Um, but yeah, if you Google uh, just um, smart Google search or Google search tricks, there's usually a couple of blogs that'll have some of these tips. Um, uh, and then let me show you one more here. Um, the file type is another good one, file type and date range. So if I'm looking at that, let me go back to my search window here. Okay, so I'm gonna pick on you again, Justin. So Justin on, and we know he's an attorney. That's to separate out the people who aren't. Okay, and then I do a date range, 2010 dot dot, and let's say 2015. That's not gonna work because I misspelled attorney. Now it's only gonna give me results that are pertinent to the years 2010 to 2015, which for whatever you're doing, it may work. That might be something you need to know, it may not. A more, for your purposes as trial attorneys, I imagine something that might be more helpful is if you do file type PDF. Now it's giving me only PDFs that feature the name Justin Kahn and he's an attorney. And you look at this and you can see PDF, PDF, PDF. Here's something that you wrote. It looks like South Carolina bar. Yeah. And um, you can get a lot of, you know, published. It looks like you appeared in a court of appeals opinion. Um, this is a really good one. File type. As, as and of counsel, course, not as a party. <laughs> okay, there we go. I'm not going to open it up anyway. All right, so, and of course you can do other file types. You know, you can do .jpg, but that's going to be an image search. Um, you can do uh, .doc. No, it didn't. Okay. 
but PDF is usually the one you want to do. All right, so uh, there's all these, these little tricks you can do for Google searching, but the main thing is don't do this. Like if you have a broken toilet, to get back to the toilet analogy, the, you don't need to Google by saying how to fix a broken toilet, right? Now, a lot of people will uh, learn to spell broken. A lot of people will just do this out of habit now because we've gotten accustomed to like smart speakers. You say, hey, hey Alexa, how do I fix a broken toilet? And so they also get in the habit of typing it out. And I see a lot of my students do this. The reason that this is, is unnecessary is because even smart speakers, all they are is a search engine in a box. And when you tell Alexa or Siri to, how do I fix the, replace the fill valve on a toilet? All Alexa's doing is saying fill valve toilet. It, it's extracting the keywords out and then it's finding the site that's most relevant to that in Google and then giving you the results. It's essentially, um, uh, it's just a Google search with your voice. Uh, and so it's the same thing when you're typing. You don't need to include anything that's not relevant to it. So if I do broken toilet, it's gonna give you the same thing, in fact, a lot faster. So um, that's the big thing. And I tell my students that all the time because when you're talking about coding, um, knowing how to find the relevant information quickly is basically the difference between an amateur and a, and a web developer who makes $100,000 a year um, is, is knowing how to Google smartly. I'm not, I mean, I'm not joking. Like, uh, it's kind of a joke in the business. Um, all right, let's see. We're getting, I'm gonna get too short on time here. Um, since we had a question about downloading entire web pages, I wanna get to that. But I will mention a few things here. Um, since all or most of you are trial attorneys um, and you probably have websites for your law firms, um, I uh, would look into the Google Custom Search API, and it's actually now it's called uh, Programmable Search Engine, and they, they changed it the other day, Programmable Search. What this lets you do is embed a custom Google Search Engine in your website. So let's say someone is, um, you know, somebody in Charleston is thinking about filing, filing a medical malpractice claim. They, they come to uh, the Colin Law Firm website. If there's a search engine there, where they can, it says, use our custom curated search engine for resources on your claim. And what you can do is you can use, you can provide a list of only the sites that you want to appear in the results that you know and trust, or you want to direct clients to, will appear in that, that's my cat. Uh, it'll be, make a custom search engine. And you can use uh, different, there's AI technology that you can incorporate. And the best thing about it is you don't need to use any code at all. They have a drag and drop sort of starter uh, platform where you can just design the, the, the web, design the uh, search bar, enter the keywords and the websites that you want to uh, include in the results and then embed it into your website. You can customize the color and everything to match your brand. Uh, this is a really great tool that a lot of people uh, don't know about. Um, and in my opinion, it adds a nice level of like trustworthiness and um, expertise right off the bat for a client who is just considering He's choosing between your law firm and another, you know, having that resource available is, it could be a nice little edge to have on your website. If you uh, don't need it on your client facing uh, website, but you do need a custom search engine for your own purposes, you can still use the custom search with Google, but there's another one that a lot of people like better is called Devon Agent. Um, and this will let you build your own, uh, basically your own custom Google search that is tailored to your needs. So you will search only for the things that you need to look at every day. Um, and it can save you a lot of time. Um, I think it costs a little bit, but not much, uh, a few bucks a month. Um, it's something you might wanna look into. The Google search uh, API is, is free. But once again, remember what I said earlier, if the tech is free, you are the product. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Ginger, I don't wanna get too skinny on time here. Um, I just wanna share a couple of things. Extinct websites, all right, as good attorneys, you know, preserving evidence is key. And um, the internet is written in ink, not in pencil. There is no such thing as an extinct website. So even though if, if it's got a 404 message and it does, it's not there anymore, it still exists. And in fact, you can see what it looked like at any point in time for the most part. So I'm just gonna go to like law.com here. And this is, uh, what law.com looked like through the years. Um, this is really just more for fun, I think, than anything else. But the key for your purposes um, 
and then I use this in my line of work as well. Boy, this brings back memories. Look at that. This was cutting edge tech right here at the time. Um, for your purposes, one thing that'll really help you is if you need to um, capture an entire website that you know is probably gonna change and you might lose evidence, like let's say somebody wrote some blog posts and it's got some incriminating um, uh, content in it and you wanna save that. Yes, you can of course save a PDF, you can do those sort of things, but you can actually save the entire website. So you can say you find it, then you can just enter the website. And now it has been archived for all posterity on the web. And so there will be a screenshot from December 9th and it will show uh, whenever, when you go and you go, well, I showed you that timeline, you can click on it and it will pull up exactly what, what it looked like and what was inside that website at the time. Um, so it's a really good way to preserve evidence, the Wayback Machine. Um, it's also free and it is a nonprofit. They're not trying to make money off your data, so. Um, all right, I wanna to get to what we were talking about earlier about downloading uh, websites, but let's see here. All right, yeah, I'm gonna do that so we can get out of time. I'm gonna skip some of these things here. The slides will be available. Um, uh, this all, all these content here, this stuff here is more about like efficient ways to collaborate with people. Um, and the idea is, and I tell my students this all the time, don't copy and paste text unless you really need to. Take a screenshot. It's a lot faster and you can still, if you need to share the information with somebody and they need access to the source, just make a link. So like I can, um, if I go into uh, email, you can take a screenshot, paste the screenshot into your email. And then if you click to the right of the, um, of the image and then drag to the left, it'll turn blue. And then a pop-up menu will come up that'll let you include the URL and it makes the image a link to that uh, source. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge trick. I do that all the time. And uh, I get that a lot from students like, how did you do that? Um, so I'll try to show you that, but, um, oh yeah. And then you're wondering how, how do you do that? On a Mac, it's shift command four. So I can show you right now. So shift command four, it'll bring up a little target and it will save a screenshot. On a uh, Windows, you just go to the search bar and you just start typing snip and it'll bring up the snipping tool and it does the same thing, okay? A lot of you probably know that, uh, but I'm a big believer in screenshots as a way to save time. Um, if you do need to share a whole lot of links, right? Um, screenshots are probably not your best bet. You don't wanna copy and paste the URL one by one from every site that you need to share. Like let's say you're onboarding a new attorney or, or a paralegal, or you're, um, you just need to share all your research on something with one of your uh, colleagues. That's where bookmarks come in, right? Um, so if you go to your bookmarks bar and you go to bookmarks manager, okay? Whenever you realize I need to share a whole lot of URLs, a whole lot of websites with somebody, make a folder, okay, in your, go up here and you can make a new folder, okay, and I could say like webinar links or something like that. And then you can, once you have a folder with all of your bookmarks that you use by clicking the star, once you have it, so like here's a bunch of, here's some coding resources that I share with my students, right? So if I want to share all of these wholesale with somebody, all I have to do is click on the folder, click command A, Okay, and it'll select everything. And then I'm just gonna put this in notes so I don't have to open up email. And then when I paste, it will paste the, hold on a second. It should paste all of the links. And the best thing about it is all the links are actual working links. That's a really big tip. So, um, you know, especially when you need to collaborate a lot with a client or uh, with your, excuse me, with a, or a client or attorney, um, that's a good way to share a lot of stuff at once. Bookmarks bar. If you need to share content on a website that is live and you need, you want to just put some sort of like digital sticky notes on a website, there are some uh, really good web page markup sites. The two that I recommend the most are web uh, markup IO and hypothesis as in .is, but markup IO is uh, the one I've been using lately. And that is a Chrome extension. So we're back to that. Um, and you make an account, it's free. And then like, if I want to, let's say um, there's some content here that I wanna annotate and share with somebody, then what I can do is I can just click on 
the, and I'm gonna have to log in and go through all this stuff here. Uh, I don't want to bother to do that. We're running out of time. And then it'll, what it'll do is it'll uh, give you the capability of adding sticky notes, highlights, and notes to a web page, and then you just share the link. And what they get when you give them the link is the annotated version of that website. Um, this is how I grade my students' assignments, actually. Uh, they build a website. It's on the internet. I say, just give me the link. I go to it, and I mark it up live on the, on the web. And then I share them the link to my uh, markup. All right, so um, let's just do one last thing here and then I'm gonna see the floor. Um, so all of these things that we've been talking about today, they're nice, they're good housekeeping tips, good habits. Um, they're not really my purview. Uh, what I really do is I, I focus on automation and uh, ways of making investigative processes more efficient. And so I specialize in like web crawling, web scraping and uh, things that will basically take the manual labor out of investigations and let computers and AI do it. Um, so I'm gonna give you a real quick preview of something that you can use uh, that attorneys I've worked with in the past have used um, that is just an example of the kind of stuff that's possible. So let's say for example, you wanna get an entire social media profile, all right? The defendant in a, in a, in a slip and fall case, or uh, you know, uh, well, that wouldn't be slip and fall unless they pushed them, but you get the, in a, in a uh, auto negligence case, um, you need to get her Facebook profile and it's public and it's massive. It's, it's 500 pages. How do you get the whole thing? Um, well, the reason it's a pain in the butt is because, uh, social media sites use this me a method called infinite scroll. Okay. So I'm going to go to my wife's uh, Facebook page here and hers is not large because she doesn't have a lot of, uh, stuff on Facebook because I've taught her well. Um, but like, let's just say she has a massive Facebook profile and you go down infinite scroll. What it does is it only loads the content that's necessary to see one screen's worth of material at a time. And then when you get to the bottom, you get that little hesitation. It's queuing the database and it's loading all the next batch of content dynamically. And that's why you have to scroll, wait, scroll, wait. And if you have a massive profile, you can spend hours trying to get the entire um, profile right? So I haven't scrolled anything yet. If I try to uh, copy, for example, I try to download this um, website right now, I'm going to print, you'll see it's only one page, right? That's because of infinite scroll, because it hasn't loaded anything beyond like the first viewport, right? So how do you get around that if you have a massive, massive profile? Well, what you can do is you can go into dev tools. And um, I'm going to, like I said, I think this is being recorded and I'll share the slides with you but you go underneath the hood, all right? It's command option J in, uh, on a Mac or command um, control option, uh, shift control I or J on a, a Windows, sorry. Um, or you can just do this. By the way, this, this is a really neat trick to, do, to solve a lot of problems, but you can just right click on a web page and then go to inspect and it gets you to the same place, but then you have to click on console, okay? So this is under the hood. This is everything that's making this happen is here. Here's the HTML code. This is the CSS that makes the styling. And then console is, this is how you can hijack a website. Now, that's why they give you a big stop warning because uh, they don't want anybody messing with it. But it also can serve some really useful functions for you. So let's, if we wanted to scroll all the way down to the bottom, how could we do that? So if you go to, I'm gonna just get you the code here. Okay. And Scott, not to interrupt you, but just when you're finished with this, yeah. we'll go ahead and pass it to Justin. Okay. I'm sorry. So let me just show you this and then we'll get out of here. All right. Um, all right. So if we go here and then I just paste this in the console, well, you've got a problem there. It will automatically scroll to the bottom. If anything that could go wrong, will go wrong. And then it will be available. It'll get automatically to the bottom so that everything is loaded and then you can print the page. Now, the problem is when you're downloading a huge, uh, a, uh, a large website uh, to PDF, a lot of times what you'll see is, see it takes a while to load the preview. And then even after you do, you see it's blank sometimes because it just has a hard time processing all of the content and creating uh, a single PDF. The workaround that I like to use for that is again, it's a Chrome extension, but there's a Chrome extension called go full page. And that lets you 
um, capture an entire website as an image. And then once it's an image, then you just save it as a, uh, as a PDF and it's there. So, um, and this one again, 4 million users, never had any problems. You, uh, so you just, you use the extension. Let's see if I have it here. And there it is. And it'll capture everything in this profile. And then see something that's large, it'll split it into three images, but then it, it'll merge those together. And then when it's ready, you just download as a PDF and you've got the entire website. This is a wonderful uh, Chrome extension. So I uh, highly recommend that one. All right. <laughs> so Thank you that so this much, was... Scott. Those, those yeah. were super helpful tips and I think can be used by everybody that's on today. So, so thank you so much for that. And thank you for accommodating no, yeah. or you for adjusting based on, on our tech <laughs> this morning. So thank you so much. Um, and Scott will stick around so that if we can get to any questions at the end, he can answer those um, as well. So thank you, Scott. Um, and now we will switch over to you, Justin, to let you take it from here. Right, thanks. And Scott, there are a couple of questions in the question and answer. Um, you might thank you, answer. Justin. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually answering them one by one here. All right, cool. Perfect. All right, I'm gonna, um, well, my plan is, is to talk about Word, Adobe, and a couple of things that we as lawyers are going to be needing to use uh, or that we use frequently and to show you how to use it better. So one of the first things I want to try to talk about is let's look at Adobe Acrobat real quick. And uh, I want to show you some of the settings. Now I've got a big monitor, so you may have to zoom in on Zoom to uh, focus on what I'm going to show you. But the uh, this, so there's my Adobe Acrobat document. And this is just, this is a deposition. And I'm gonna show you some tricks for doing some searches that you may not be aware of in terms of Adobe Acrobat. There's actually a difference between find and search. So when you do command F on the Mac or even on the PC, there'll be this little find window that appears. If you type in a term and I don't even, I'm just gonna make up one, uh, I'll put in Allison because a lawyer that was in our firm who was taking this deposition, you see where Adobe Acrobat is telling you that's going to appear 54 times in this deposition. If you hit return, it takes you to the first one. You hit return again, the second, and so on. So you have no sense of if you are in the middle of a trial and you're trying to find something, this is a horrible way to search for something. There's a different way to search. This is the find tool. Acrobat actually has something called a search tool. And instead of doing find, if you do shift command F, this window on the left will appear, which is the search window. This is a much better tool. And we're gonna focus on right here in a moment, including bookmarks and comments. So right here, if I type in the word Allison and hit search, this is gonna to present to me something much more akin to uh, like a Google find or something, a Google search. So now I can find the word in the context of the PDF and click on it and it will take you automatically there to that point. So in a nutshell, that's the difference between search and find, which is a huge difference. And let's look at one of the, a couple of the other features with search that most people don't know about. And I'll move it over here. Right here, it's, you can limit it to search in the current document for that term, or you can tell Acrobat to look at all the PDF documents on your local disk or on a connected server. So you can search for a particular term throughout the PDFs on your hard drive. Let's just keep it right here on the current document. And let's show you an example of something that uh, could be a problem. If in Adobe Acrobat, one of the things that you have the ability to do, I'll just go to the first page, or maybe the second page here. One of the things you can do is, let's do this. Uh, one of the things you can do, I'm trying to get my tool up so you can see what I'm doing. If you navigate down to the next page, let's say I wanna make some kind of comment about this deposition. And so there's various commenting tools. One of them is the highlighter tool. And I'm using Adobe Acrobat DC for the Mac. But if you click on the highlighter tool, now you'll be able to, when you select text in the PDF that's text, you can then highlight it and click on the highlighter tool and it makes it a particular color. If you want, and that's, um, now a comment basically in your PDF. If you want to change the color, let's say for whatever reason you don't like the yellow, 
if you right click on the color, you can then go to properties and change the color. So a lot of people don't know that. Some people like to use red versus blue or whatever it might be. So you can then click on the color right here and then choose a different color to use. So you can go to the little crayon thing and let's say I want it to be light blue for whatever reason. So I click on that and hit okay and now that's blue. Now you can then also set if that's, if you always want to use a light blue highlighter in your Adobe Acrobat PDF highlighting, you can then say make properties default every time you're using that highlighter tool, it will always be in that color you select. So if you have a favorite highlighter color, that's the way you can do it. Another thing you can do is if you are somebody who likes to color code uh, concepts or ideas in your case. So blue might mean to you, you know, lying. Red might be damages. Green might be whatever it might be. You can then select different parts of your PDF in different colors. So what I'll, and I'll give you an example of that. Let's say I highlight here for whatever reason that term and I wanna highlight it with, let's just make it blue. What it's, uh, you notice to the right while I'm doing this, this highlight comment appears as a comment. So I wanna make this one blue So now you've got two different highlighted tools that are acting as comments. So I can jump back and forth between those comments. Um, it's actually a way to search the comment or you search your, uh, where you've highlighted throughout the document. So you can have a highlight that is a comment to yourself, or you can actually make a true comment. So you can put, make, create a sticky note. And right here are these different kinds of tools available to add, uh, I'll call it annotations to your PDF. And you have different ones, a sticky note, a highlighter tool, typing tools, and so on. And I know I'm flying through these, but if you have Adobe Acrobat, uh, my goal is to try to just sh not do a deep dive, but just show you some of the tools available to you that you can play around with. So let's just say I want to make a sticky note. I can click on that and drop right here a sticky note. And I'm going to make a comment that something like, um, I'll put uh, cross, well, let's, let's do something that won't be, I'll put, um, uh, great cross exam. Okay, so that's my comment and I wanna click post. So now this, when I hover over it, that comment will appear. Now let's say one, one of the problems with that, I was gonna show you the difference between find and search. So let's say you've marked up your PDF and you've made comments or highlights of various kinds. And you now want to, you're searching through your PDF, you know somewhere in there you've made a comment, this is a great cross. So if you do command F and you do the find and you type in great cross and hit return, it doesn't appear. It says it's not there. And you know damn well that that comment is there and find is not finding it. So what's going on? Well, Adobe Acrobat is only searching through the text, I'll call it of the PDF, not in the comments. So if you use this search tool and that's shift command F on the um, Mac and change your search term to great cross right here where it says include bookmarks and comments, check those off and you say search, now it will find it. So now you can find those comments that you know you have made that, um, that might, you, you might use your own language as opposed to the language that's in the PDF. So that's a very quick look at the difference between find and search that is, I think is an important tool. And the same thing with um, when you're doing bookmarks, let's say you create a bookmark on page and pick a page. Let's say the, here's where the witness is sworn on the, you can just click add right here to bookmark. And a bookmark is just a shortcut to this particular page. So let's just say uh, beginning, uh, begin cross or whatever it might be. Nope. I'll just call it start. <laughs> Think. Start a depot. All right, so now that's a bookmark. So when you click on a bookmark, it takes you to a particular page. So if you are wherever here and you want to go back to the start of the depot, you click here and it'll take you back to the spot. So that's, you've seen when you use PDF um, directions that a company has created these various bookmarks 
again, instead of spending all kinds of time going into the deep dive of how to create bookmarks, I just want to show you that how you can do that and then how you can search it. So those are a couple tips and tricks with Adobe Acrobat, commenting uh, and bookmarks. Let's talk about another tool that people um, use often, but not very well for various reasons. I want to open up Keynote real quick. This is, while we pull this up, this is my, um, my desk setup. Um, if John's on here, John Romano very much likes my boom microphone right here. He likes the way that sounds better. So if you're going to be doing uh, matters for over the next several months with the lockdowns and various things going on, you might want to invest in a nicer mic to have. Uh, this is a, um, a, a blue mic you can get at uh, Best Buy or something like that. And it's got a little arm that you can hang to connect to your desktop so you can, you can move it in and out of frame and whatever it might be. So uh, this is my laptop, which I've got to my left. So I can see certain things. This is my big monitor right here, my camera. <clears throat> I keep an iPad here from time to time. And then in a moment, we'll talk about this IPvo that I keep right here. And notice I have a ring light, which does a couple things. One is when you are presenting information to a witness during a deposition or a judge during a hearing, and I've used the IPvo for motion hearings, if the light from the ceiling casts a shadow on the arm of the IPvo onto what you're showing, this ring light can not only light up your face, but also get rid of the shadow that's right here. So in terms of sort of a basic setup, I would suggest if you're going to be using an IPvo and be using a webcam, get yourself a ring light to help uh, with certain lighting. All right, uh, I was gonna show you uh, this concept about taking a snapshot and what that is. So let's look at what the snapshot tool is and how you can use it and how it might work. Let's, I'm gonna just add a blank slide real quick. So imagine you're doing a presentation and you want to grab a piece of, here's an accident report right here. Let's say you want to put, put into your, act, uh, put into your um, presentation a part of the accident report. So from time, basically you're gonna, the old fashioned way to think about it is literally using scissors to cut something out and paste it somewhere else. So let's say for whatever reason, I'm gonna use this part of the collision report in my slide. In Adobe Acrobat, there's a tool and it's up here under um, edit. It's called the take a snapshot. So this is specific to Adobe Acrobat. This isn't simply the um, snapshot tool <clears throat> that you saw earlier that you use system-wide. This is specific to Adobe Acrobat. So within Adobe Acrobat, you can say, take a snapshot. I click on that and a little crosshairs appears and I can then click on a corner, drag, and then I'm gonna select the area that I'm going to I'll let go. And that is actually that square or that information is copied into the clipboard and I can now paste it somewhere else. So, and I'll show you an example of using that here in dropping into a slideshow presentation. I hit paste and now this image appears. So that's how you can, if you're doing a presentation, you can copy and paste images into your uh, presentations. And I'm gonna show you the difference in the quality in a second, but let's also look at a Word document. You can do the same thing. If you're presenting something to the court and you have a Word document, you can hit paste and now you're dragging and drop and you're pasting into your Word document that image that you might wanna be using for a court filing um, now let's look at the difference between the qualities of those images. And there's a default setting in Adobe Acrobat that I'm gonna have you change. This particular image is set at, um, let me try to move this out of the way. It's set at um, 75 dots per inch. Uh, so if I expand this out, so if I expand it out, you can see it's sort of grainy or pixelated. Adobe Acrobat has set by default when you take a snapshot to have it set at a, what I'll call a low resolution. And I'm gonna show you where you can alter that and why you should. In Adobe Acrobat, there's some preferences. So you go over here to preferences and you're then presented with all these different things that you can tweak. One of which is this, where it says general, you click on that and then there's something right here that says used fixed resolution for snapshot tool images. 
Acrobat defaults that size to 72. Click on it and change it to 300. And I'm going to hit OK. What that does is, so now when I take the snapshot image, the same one, and copy it into memory, I want to paste it right next to this one. And not only is it larger, but it's much clearer. Um, so what you've got is it's not pixelated, oops, it's not pixelated and it's a much clearer image. Um, so what you, we've got going on is the, let's try to find, I'm just gonna, what this is, this is 300 DPI and this is, this is at 75. So with an image or text, when you're grabbing something out of a textbook or even out of a police report, if you're gonna grab a piece of it, it looks so much better when you have that resolution set much higher. A lot of times for those who have tried to use pieces of documents in uh, presentations or in a something a submission to the court, it looks very pixelated and that's how you can change that. You go to that Adobe Acrobat setting for the snapshot tool and change it to 300 DPI versus the default setting of 72. A couple things with Adobe Acrobat. There are, if you haven't used the newer one or you are confused like I am, I've been using Acrobat forever, but I still forget where certain tools are. I know, for example, I want to use a redaction tool and I can't figure out for the life of me where it is. I can look all over the place, Using Adobe Acrobat, if you click right here where it says search tools and you put in the name of the tool you're looking for, like redact, it will then pull it up for you. You click on it and it will pull up that tool so that you can then start using it. And so it makes it a lot easier for you to find it. And it shows you this is the redaction tool. That's what the pink thing is. You close it um, and then you can look for your next tool. Let's say, for example, you want to OCR a document type in OCR and you don't know where that tool is, you type it in right there, you say recognize text and Acrobat finds that tool for you. You click on it and it will begin that process. So if you're having difficulty finding a tool or you can't remember where it is, type it in right here into the search corner and, and it will find the tool for you. And a couple of things, when you are dealing with size limitations, like I, I have a larger monitor. If you have a smaller monitor and screen real estate is valuable, if you click on these disclosure triangles, you'll be able to see more or less of the tools on each side, the bookmarks and so on. All right, so that's Acrobat real quick. Uh, bookmark, da, da, da. All right, so let's look at Word now real quick for a couple things to do with Word that I think are helpful for lawyers to uh, use. All right, let's, this is what I'll call a typical document that you might be submitting to the court. And I'm going to show you some things about this document that's a template that I use to submit a memos to the court and what I've done to set it up. Uh, the first thing is if, if you go to a new document in Adobe Acrobat, it, you have there's a default setting and your sort of form temp uh, form normal document opens up. If you have set up, you can set up certain documents as templates. So if you go to new from template. Adobe Acrobat will present you with a series of, if you already have created them, templates that you may have created or ones, did I say Adobe? <laughs> the Word will uh, present to you that um, you can use to start off a process. Uh, the reason why I'm showing you this is once you create a document that you want to be replicating the formatting for over and over, then you want to save it as a template so you can then pull it up in the future. Like I have a template for a state court memo versus a federal court memo, um, letterhead, envelope, and so on. So at any point in time, or even um, you know, intake forms, um, somewhere I have even appellate, uh, an appellate, uh, here's a four circuit brief. So I have these forms saved so I don't have to go back and recreate the wheel. But let's talk about uh, the particular document that I've already started creating and I'll share this uh, template with you and talk about some of the tools that are available that you may not know about built into Word. Now, a couple things are when you, 
sometimes you will see a document that when you type text, your name starts appearing next to it and you're like, what the hell's going on? So if you go into the, uh, there's a track changes. I'm waiting for John to tell me where that is. Da -da -da, track changes, a oh, review. So if you click on review, uh, there's a button right here that says track changes. When that is on and it says all markup, if you get a document that someone else prepared and you start making changes to it, it starts turning it these weird colors and uh, it shows that the changes you have made. So this is additional text. Now, when that appears, um, that if you don't get rid of showing all markup, you, when you print this text or turn it into the court, the court will see it just like this with little notes about who made those changes. The reason why it's not appearing right here is because I'm the same one that's done this change. Uh, sometimes when you, you may see somebody has filed with the court a, what appears to be a PDF, which is a Word document where there's a whole bunch of markup changes on the side because somebody didn't get rid of them. In order to get rid of that sort of red color, and I'll zoom in on it, this red color and this thing that might appear along the side that shows where the change was made, you go to all, instead of showing all the markups, you're gonna say, go to no markup. Now it will look normal. Even though within the document, the markups do appear, they won't appear when you print them. So if it drives you nuts, that when you go to print a document that somebody else has sent you that you've marked up, that's what's going on. Uh, Word is showing you the markups versus you can just turn that off. You can still track the changes to keep up with who has made what changes. So that's track changes in a nutshell for the people who deal with that and it drives them nuts. Um, another thing that I wanna talk about real quick is the idea of dropping images into a Word document. Earlier, we pasted this into a Word document. Word itself allows you to crop an image once you've dropped it in. So let's say for whatever reason, I want to manipulate this image in Word that is crop it. So I wanna get rid of some of the, this top part where it says North. If I right click and click on crop, now these little handles appear and I can just gra grab that handle and drag down to here. And when I let go and click outside of it, that part is gone from what is visible within the document. So effectively I have cropped an image within Word uh, to show the court. So that's the crop tool that sort of, that's built into a word from time to time when you drop in images, that's how you can do that. You can also right click and do things like um, add borders and some other things. You can format the picture. If you right click, then you have certain options available to you. You can uh, click on these different tools to make a line around, the, around this um, image that you've got here. So I can put a solid line and now it creates this little line and I can change the color of it. I can make it red, whatever I might want. And I can change the uh, thickness of it right here by the width and so on. But again, my goal is not to do a deep dive into all this stuff. It, I wanna show you some tools that are available in apps you already have that you may not have played with or figured out how to use. So again, you can play with this later on, but I just wanna show you real quick some things that you can do. You can, so what you've now seen is how we can drop an image to a Word document, crop it and add a border to it. And that could be something that we can print and show off, uh, send off to the court. Uh, one of the other things that is an important concept to wrap your head around is this. In a document, A lot of times this isn't visible. You may just be used to seeing a document that looks like this. You just see the words. And you may not wreck, one of the things is this. I've got this tool right here, which show hides formatting. So when I click this on, I can now see the, what I'll call the hidden codes within the document to see what Word is doing. Like right here, if I zoom in, you can see there's a, that dot represents a space. This arrow represents a tab. 
and so on. This is a paragraph return and so on. You've got these different codes that are embedded. If I turn off the visibility of that, I don't see it, but I now understand how Word is, um, why it's showing the document the way it is. So that's a tool or a feature you might want to use that show and hide. If you have problems with formatting, that's a great thing to turn on to figure out what's going on in the document. An important tool to get used to is the um, style pane. And let's see if we can get our heads wrapped around that. So let's say we've got a brief we're working on in which we have a heading, something like concise summary of the nature of the case. And I've typed some text for the court to use or to explain my argument for the court. You then have a next level of something. If I, this right here is a particular, is a formatted style. It is a heading style. And this little dot to the left shows me that it is a particular kind of style. If I go to the style pane, I can now see it is of the kind heading one. I can now make a formatting style that is called heading one and will always represent a certain way of looking. So imagine you're drafting a complaint or if you're in a memo, you always wanna have heading one be maybe the causes of action, but with a Roman numeral one or Roman numeral. You can set that style up and then repeat it and you don't have to reformat it each time. And I'll show you an example of that. So let's say, so here's another place where this same style appears. If I click on it, that's heading one style. If I go to this one right here, you see it changes into heading two and it's actually formatted slightly differently. It's got a, a number and it's got a 14 point font times uh, new Roman. Let's say for whatever reason, I always want the heading two to be uh, red for whatever stupid reason. If I select that, then it's only changing this particular one. And that might be what you're used to when you type a complaint. You go through and you manually or physically format each part of the complaint and it drives you nuts. If you have repeat sort of styles or headings that you're gonna be using, you can tell, now remember this is heading two. So here's another heading two kind that doesn't have that color, but let's say I always want heading two to be red. I can type or select in this area and I go to heading and right here I can click on drop down and do modify style. And what I'm gonna tell Word is every time I'm dealing with heading two in this document, I want it to be a certain way. I want it to be maybe Times New Roman 18 points. I want it to be italicized. And maybe I want to even change uh, if I go into font, I might be able to change some other specific things about that font. So for example, let's say I want, um, I'm just waiting for it to pull up. I want it to be small caps and I want the, I'm looking for color to be blue. And I hit okay. From now on, when I hit okay, that's just because I selected that one to be red. These have all changed to reflect that. The reason why this did not is because I had manually changed it to have a different color. Let's say I now want to format this style to match this one. If I click on it once, there's actually a paintbrush tool right here. And what that does is it copies the format of the formatting you have to a different place. So I've selected within this format of this style I click on the little paintbrush and then I click right here. Oh, let me try this way. I think. So now I'm going to select that style there and it now makes that match that same kind of formatting style. So once again, let's say I always want heading two to be a particular way within the document. I'll modify the style and you'll, you'll watch. <laughs> I'm trying to point, but you can't see what I'm pointing at. So I want to watch these uh, two and one change. So I'm going to change it from bold and italics. I'll get rid of that. And I'm just going to hit OK. It automatically changes those styles throughout the document. So again, you, this allows you to pre-format and set up a certain way that you want your document to look. And you don't have to reformat it each time you um, create text. Another example is this. 
let's say this was going to be a deposition quote. I've got a style set up for deposition quote. So if I click on it, it automatically does it as a courier font and it centers it within the document. So imagine when you're typing up a document and you're putting in this information, all the things that you would have to do to get it to be formatted to look like that, uh, you can take care of with setting up a style and then just um, selecting it in, on the right side using the style pane to uh, format it that particular way. So that's it in a nutshell. You can learn a lot more about it, but I don't wanna um, spend too much time on that. And let's see. Oh, another feature people often ask about is dictation. They say, hey, should I get some dictation software for uh, my Mac? What dictation software do you recommend? Built into a, uh, Word is this little dictate button. If you click on it, and right now I'm, I'm just gonna tap right here and I wanna start talking. This is an example of dictation. So it automatically typed whatever it was. Uh, you don't look, I didn't need any head you know, ma magic headsets, no $200 software. It's built into the software. So the ability to dictate into it directly into a document exists for those of you who like to, who still like to dictate things. Um, Track changes, drop images, da, da, da. Okay, those are some things I covered in Word. Let me, let me talk now about an IPvo. I can't tell if there's any questions. Do I write all my complaints in Latin? <laughs> yes, I do. That's, <laughs> I don't know the Latin phrase for yes, but yes. Um, let me show you something that I have been using for a while, this IPvo device and how I use that and what it can be used for and how that might work. Uh, let's see that. All right, so why you're switching, sorry to interrupt you. Somebody asked if you're able to zoom in on your screen so they can see more easily. Yeah, I told them, yes, the answer is yes. That's actually a feature built into Zoom. I, I said, I think I said in the beginning, I have a larger monitor. So within Zoom itself, whoever has the issue, you can actually, there's some settings for, and I can't remember if as a host, I can see them now. But when you click in the view, there's some settings that you, when you are watching, you can change how you see the program. So the short answer is yes and no. I have a large monitor. So what you're seeing is on your smaller monitor, my large monitor. And so it's, I'll, I'll try to keep that in mind and I'll, I'll, I'll do that with my, um, yeah, I'm so sorry about the arrows. Well, hopefully you got the idea of it. I'll, I don't know how else to show some of these things. It, with Zoom, if I, show the entire window of a particular app, you may not be able to see the menu bar. And so that was the compromise I tried to reach. So I apologize. So well, I'm gonna to try to show you some things with, I'll take that into account as I try to show you this thing with my IPvo. And IPvo is a device that's used to um, present information. And you can do that whether you're in court. And recently I've been using that in motion hearings. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and how I use it and how it can be uh, and what you can do with that. And I realize I'm not showing anything yet, so don't worry. Um, one of the things that I, I do is this. So I've got to set up. Um, I realize now that I've shown it. An IPvo is a device that's used, uh, it's basically a camera on an arm. And it's sitting here to my right. I'll show it to you in a second on this camera. But right now, I just want to show you what it can do. What I try to do in terms of setting up this IPvo is in order to um, make sure when I go to present something for a court or for deposition, whatever it is, I use a drawing pad. The lay down and I and set it up just right, whatever I will put, if I put it there, it's almost like a built-in frame. So I know what the court witness or somebody else will see. So I suggest that you either come up with a frame or a size document or just take a 11 by 17 piece of paper and draw a square around it and come up with a place that where you know you'll put a document, it will be seen. So that's, uh, that's just sort of what I'll call step one. When you set up the IPvo, you want to make sure uh, that there's a question about the dictation tool. It's somewhere in Word. 
I don't know. You do a Google search for it. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll try to pull that up towards the end. So when you set up this IPvo, it's got an arm, an articulating arm, so I can actually pull the camera up and down and bring things in and out of focus. One of the things I highly suggest you do is this happens to be at the edge of my desk right next to my trash can. So when I show up things, when I turn on something for court, I make sure not to start off there. <laughs> so have your know where pre set up your IPvo or whatever it is you're going to be doing, know what's going to be in the background, orient your camera first and have that piece of paper ready to go so that you're not showing things like your book bag or whatever else it might be um, nearby. Now, let me show you an example of using an IPvo that I had uh, for court. I think, can y'all see the IPvo, the screen that says IPvo here or not? Yes. IPvo. Okay, okay. All right. Good. All right. Um, what this window does, it allows me to control information I'm going to be presenting to the judge. So this window, this entire, uh, what's within this will be what's seen by the judge or the witness, the sort of square area right here. These are the tools I have available to me as somebody who is presenting it or using the tool. So one of the things that I can do and I like to use is this little box right here so that when I'm in the middle of presenting something to the judge, it's like a window within the window so I can now talk to the judge or the witness and they can see me and I can be pointing out things on the document at the same time. Let me make that go away a second. All right, so now let's just say I have a document. Let me give an example of how I used the IPvo or how you can use an IPvo in a matter. I had a hearing recently before a judge in which uh, the other side was arguing about something. We did a motion hearing by uh, webcam. And it was, I think it was WebEx. And the other side was arguing about a particular order. And they were pointing out to the judge that the order that I was claiming said something, um, I'll answer that question in a second, uh, didn't support what I was arguing. And so they were making this big point that, the, that what Mr. Khan was arguing about is nowhere in this order. And when it was my turn, I turned on my IPvo and I said to the judge, I said, judge, they were saying that the point I wanted to make and that I am making is not contained in this order. What the other side did not show the court was page two of the order. <laughs> and had they shown you page two, they would have seen the point I was trying to make. And it shows exactly what I'm trying to argue. So to me, the power of this IPvo was to be able to in real time, even I won't say even with a judge, but the power of showing a judge a document in real time that the other side was um, less than candid with the court about had a big impact. Another thing it allows me to do, I teach law school classes, but whether you're dealing with witnesses or something else, you can literally, you can draw out an idea. So you can, let's say you've got a document or let's say you're meeting with a client and you've got a document to go through. And you're like, hold on a second. What do you mean about this part right here? Whatever it might be. So when you said that, you know, you can ask whatever questions of the witness or of your client about a particular document. So you can go through a document in real time with the um, witness. And what I'm doing is actually using a physical pen and marking up the document. One of the things IPvo built into it is a, it's a free tool that you can download and allows you to use these annotation features. So right here where it says, this, it's got this little pen icon. If I click on it, I have a, if I click on this color, I then have several different colors to choose from. Let's say I want to mark up this document uh, with this blue tool. So I can now draw here and I'm not actually destroying the document. You see the blue is, you know, it's just within this window right here. So in real time, I can mark up a document for the court or for the witness, whatever it might be, and emphasize something to whoever's watching this. I can then take a picture of the way that document is now with this markup. So if I click on this camera icon, it, you heard the little camera thing, and it saves the picture with the markups into a folder that I can access later and print or do whatever with. If I wanna get rid of those marks, I can just clear it all and then it's gone. So one of the people asked where, um, there was a, let me get rid of this feature. 
uh, they were asking how I did that picture in picture thing within this IPVO app called Visualizer. It's a free app you can download from the Apple from the App Store. I think it's the same way on the PC, but I'm not sure. There's some boxes down here on the right. So if I click on this window right here, and IPVO is well, here. Watch, I'll do this. Somebody asked how to spell IPVO. I P V O. That's IPVO. Um, and then I also have, well, I'll show you another one in a second, but um, so this is the picture within a picture. So if you, this little box allows you to have, if you've got a separate camera, it can put it within this other camera view so that while I'm arguing something to the judge, I could be, or to the witness or whatever it might be, or imagine, I don't know if, oh, let's say you've got a model of something, you know, a brain, I don't have a Medivisual's brain on me, but you know, you want to show somebody how to do a Rubik's cube or whatever it might be. You can actually, you can show a 3D model to the audience. So it doesn't have to be simply a piece of paper. That's one of the advantages in my mind of using a tool like this is you can hold up a model. And again, this can be used at trial, not just in this sort of um, COVID world. During trial, you can use a device like this to show things other than um, just pieces of paper. Uh, a couple of those, you can also do the sort of side by side thing. So there are a couple of different ways to, let me go back to this. You can also do a sort of split screen where you have two different, where I have the camera and the document shown. So that's the, those are some of the tools available for the IP bill. Let me stop the sharing a second so you can see the tool that I'm using. So this is an IP bill itself. And also let me turn this on. All right, so this is the IPVO itself, or this is one of the IPVOs. And one of the things you will see when you try to order one of these right now is the website says they are sold out because they are. The company that makes them has this particular model. I think it's $2.99 when it's available. You can go on Amazon and they're like $4.99 or more now. Uh, but there's some, let me just show it to you. And then I'll, I also have a smaller one that I'll show you in a second. But some of the tools available on the IPVO, when you plug it in, there's a, some buttons to turn on a light. Uh, you can zoom in and out. Um, and there's some other features where you can, you can turn on a light so you can have a light on the object that you're showing. Um, on the back, you can connect this, this particular model, the reason why I liked it is it's a wireless setup that also has a battery built in. So this will supposed to last eight or so hours. So without any wires, I can, from my computer, connect to this IPVO and show the images to a jury. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other features. You can also, they have an HDMI cable in the back where you can, or HDMI plug-in. So you can plug in an HDMI cable right there to it to connect to a TV or monitor to show what you want to show. Uh, so th this, this is this particular IPVO model in a nutshell. Uh, let me turn it off. And one of the ones they also another one they came out with recently is this little portable one that is again I don't know if these are available anymore because they sold out so fast but literally it's an IPVO model that's this big and it's you can rotate the camera and it's got a little USB cable to plug into your computer and now you've got a camera to show whatever it is you want to show and it's portable so you can put those in your backpack to take with you with your computer so you don't even have to take this larger one with you. Uh, so those are uh, some things with IPVO. I was watching my time. Oh, I can show a couple other apps real quick unless people have questions. I, I do wanna show one particular app that I like to use. Um, so I think I've answered that. Can the IPVO be connected wirelessly to the iPad? There's an app now IPVO came out with. I think it's a subscription. I just got it. Uh, let me tell you what it's called. Because if you can't get an IPVO, there's an app called iDocCam. So it's the letter I, D-O-C, C-A-M. And it's by the IPVO people. And it allows you to turn your iOS device into basically an IPVO. What it does is it turns on the camera on your phone and you have certain tools you can select. You can then connect your phone to your computer and so basically this is your IPVO camera is conceptually what's going on. I think that's a subscription for this app, but it's a neat way if you can't get the IPVO to start basically creating an IPVO via this app. 
The other thing I would suggest is if you're going to be using that app to get yourself something like a tripody kind of thing that you're uh, uh, that you can get at like Best Buy, where you can connect your phone to there, rotate it, and that way your hands are out of the view and you're able to see whatever it is that you're showing. Basically, again, using this IPVO app, um, you connect it to the computer. I just barely started playing with it, so I can't recommend it one way or another, but I know that's a, a potential workaround. Um, how to create the little box, let me answer that. Dictation tool, I think, was in Word. All right, so let me, sh I'm gonna show a couple of apps for organizing information that I think are helpful, and then I'll stop because I'm watching the time. Uh, this is a cool app that I love to use. Um, and I'll share the screen. For people who like to organize information, um, I really recommend something called uh, Mind Node or Mind Mapping. Let me see this. Let's do it this way. What I'll show you, this is the, let me stop the share and start sharing this one. All right, so what mind mapping allows you to do is this. Instead of thinking about an outline linearly, it allows you to create uh, an outline in no particular order, but this will make sense in a second. So imagine you've got a case, you know, a simple car wreck case. You know, and you're going to have to establish, you know, you have to establish that um, what the duty was, there was a breach, uh, damage, Approximate cause. All right. Now that might be your rough outline. And you think to yourself, oh, wait a second. For I'd rather have damage here. Great. Damage. Oh, who am I going to use? Well, I can have the plaintiff. I want to need the ER doc. Um, oh, and then all of a sudden you think to yourself, oh, wait a second, duty. I'm going to need to show what statute was involved. Um, it's like, oh, wait, so maybe I need to look at the police report. That Maybe that has it. So you can see in real time, you're able to get your thoughts down without being limited by a linear sort of way of thinking of things. And it's a, it allows you to very quickly organize information and get it down and capture it. Here's a mind map I did for um, a show I did yesterday with Jay Vaughn where we were talking about the trial pad app, okay? <laughs> so what we did was, you know, what are we going to show first? You know, let's show some examples, whatever. It might. Let me, you can't see what I'm doing. So you're able to see, I can now within the mind mapping app, get down the thoughts I want to do and cover in no particular order. And you can see how you can come up with these branches and ideas. And I use this all the time for cross-examination of witnesses. I also um, use it for preparing for oral arguments. I may have a mind map and it's just one sheet of paper that I put on an 11 by 17 piece of paper so that when I show up for court, I don't have to look around at all my different documents. I have it all organized on this one page. Um, I'm very aware of the time. I tried to buzz through a bunch of different snippets of ideas to make sure that uh, I gave you an overall, uh, some ideas to hopefully you can use for different kinds of apps and hopefully it was helpful. I'm sure we can cover additional stuff later on. I hope if you have any questions, just email me at jscon at conlawfirm.com and I don't know if there are any other questions. I don't see any opening questions, open questions. I hope I've answered them and hopefully it was helpful. Thank you, Justin. It was extremely helpful. I think you and Scott both did a great job of answering questions as we went along. I did see one question um, that I'll pose to you in the event that you know the answer, but somebody asked if you, if anybody knew how to admit um, the archived website information that Scott taught us how to pull, how to admit that into evidence. Um, oh yeah, I actually go ahead, Justin. But I think it looks like some. Uh, I was going to get. I have M. Winkle that. Reed's book on yeah. website stuff, um, on foundations for evidence. I'll try to see if I can find a particular chapter on that. But my guess is it's as simple as in, you know. Foundationally, remember under the rules of evidence, in order to get something in, you just have to show that it it is what the proponent purports it to be. And so whether your client has said it or probably you've got an expert who says, look, I went to this website, timemachine.org is a well-recognized website. Here's what it does. Here's something I got from it, blah, blah, blah. And potentially also that, that's sort of the foundational part. Separately, it could be considered if it's the opponent's 
website, it can be an admission. So it's not even hearsay. It's a statement by the opponent in the past. So that I think there's different ways to get that in. Perfect. Thank you. I know there's some conversation about it in the chat as well, but I thank you both Scott and Justin. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Today was wonderful and extremely informative. So I see Ginger is back because I think we have two giveaways to do. Yes, we sure do. And um, oh my gosh, Justin, Scott, you guys did a fantastic job. I'm already getting like lots of questions. Everybody wants to know, one, can I get a recording of this webinar? Two, can I get a copy of your PowerPoint slides? Um, so what I'll do is I probably need a couple days to get everything formatted, but we will make sure that you guys get a copy of this if you would like it. And then um, also send you over some materials from today, but highly recommend you know, Justin, Scott, they're kind of like my go-to guys. So if I have questions, I ask them and I encourage you to do the same thing. But now we have some fun giveaways to do. And I've got uh, Paul and I've got Ted with me today. Um, Ted is a wonderful guy. He actually is the HMR marketing director. He helps me do all kinds of fun things, but mostly this wonderful giveaway. So Ted, thank you for stepping in for Kyle. And if you don't mind, Let's see who won and please let them know what they won. Yeah, so uh, Brandon Carr with the Ledger Law Firm in uh, Newport Beach, California, just won four bags of Peruvian coffee. So uh, I think that's just wonderful. Yay, congratulations, Brandon. And um, Ted, I guess both of us, we will reach out to Brandon after this webinar and um, make sure that he gets that wonderful coffee. Yeah, I'll get heard... it ordered up fresh for him. Exactly, they, I think they do it before they mail it, they like grind it up and send it right out. Yep, um, next day ship, so they, they roast it and next day it shipped out. So it's absolutely fresh. Thank you so much for doing this for us. We appreciate it. Yeah, never and have too much coffee. Everybody gets all of your contact information after this webinar. And then everyone, please go to connectshaji.com because tomorrow we have one more free webinar and it's gonna be great. It's gonna be with Mark Kozardowski and he's gonna be talking about nursing home abuse cases. Um, so you do not want to miss that. Um, thank you again for watching, for sharing this with all of your friends. Mm -hmm. And a big thanks again to Haley, Justin, and Scott for doing a great job today. Thanks for having us. Thank that you. Was great content. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye, everyone.